Taylor Swift is actually a big reason I'm picking the Chiefs to win. I'm relentless. Can you feel this? I'm going all in. It's time to cash in. One moment in time. Let's get at this. Be tremendous. Relentless. I'm relentless. Here we go. This is the Skip Bayless Show. Episode, drum roll please, 100. In honor of keeping it 100, as I always do, maybe to a fault. Yep, we made it to the century mark here. In honor of the LA neighborhood I live in, Century City. On episode 100, I will go into depth about the impact of the biggest star in sports right now, Taylor Swift. I will also tell you why Patrick Mahomes will not have a spectacular Super Bowl game, once again, but why he will win said Super Bowl game this Sunday. I will tell you why my Dallas Cowboys, to me, have become unspeakable. I'll tell you why I hope Bill Belichick gets a job next year so he'll get further exposed. I'll tell you what I'm hearing from inside the Eagles about why They collapse, losing six of their last seven. You'll be interested in this, I believe. And I'll answer some of your questions about whether I'll attend a Super Bowl party and what my Super Bowl food of choice is. But first up, as always, it is not to be skipped. This has become the biggest story in sports. This story believe it or not, has transcended the Super Bowl. This story almost certainly will make this Super Bowl the most watched ever. And I'm talking, of course, about Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift the most powerful couple in sports history. Because no one in the world right now has a larger fan base or more influence outside of politics than she does. And now she has coupled with one of the biggest stars and the biggest personality by far, in the most popular game in America, our football. And now we have Travis Kelsey and his Chiefs in the Super Bowl. You you cannot get bigger than this. So I must admit I must backtrack, and I must say that I was skeptical at first, as you know from listening to this show. Now I'm not skeptical at all. In fact, Taylor Swift is actually a big reason I'm picking the Chiefs to win. But at first, yeah, you you better believe I thought that Travis Kelsey's relationship with her would turn into a distraction of a downfall for the Chiefs. I mean, she was so big. She is so big. Too big, I thought, or suspected, for one football team to withstand. And remember, Football to me, beyond baseball, beyond basketball, beyond hockey, beyond any other sport, the other football, 
our football, NFL football, is the ultimate we game. All for one, one for all unity is always a key to any Super Bowl run by any team. I just thought he, as in Travis, would, would lose some focus, some of the required focus, the highest level of focus, trying to keep up with her global nonstop schedule. And for sure, I, I thought his coach, Andy Reid, his quarterback, Patrick Mahomes, many of his teammates, all the better players on the team, would soon just get sick and tired of having to answer questions about a pop star. I've seen it happen too many times. Man, was I wrong about that. Monday night, if you watched opening media night in Las Vegas, Andy Reid, Patrick Mahomes, Kansas City Stars, they all seem to welcome questions about Taylor Swift and Travis. They seem to embrace opportunities to talk about her and him. So what's been my experience in the past with these kind of celebrity couplings within sports? Hark back quickly, 2007, I was a big San Antonio Spurs fan. They wound up going to the finals that year, sweeping LeBron's Cavs. Remember Tony Parker and Eva Longoria? She was seven years older than Tony, but she managed to infiltrate and ingratiate herself into that team structure where they, they began to love her like a sister, in some cases a big sister. She cooked for them. She traveled with them. Uh, Coach Popovich began to allow her to fly on the team plane with them. She became a part of that team's infrastructure that year. Obviously, she went on after the June finals to marry Tony. Wasn't it 8808? I think it was in Paris. Didn't work out, but it was a big deal then. And I thought it benefited Tony, who was the finals MVP, and that team. And then right on the heels of that relationship came Tony Romo, Jessica Simpson. Cowboys had a great year that year. Regular season, won the one seed, had a week off ahead of their home game against the Giants. You probably know the infamous story. Tony and Jessica, along with Jason Witten and his wife, went to Cabo San Lucas in that off week ahead of the practice week building up to the Giants game at home. And Eli, on his way to beating Tom Brady in the Super Bowl, went into Jerry World and did a number on Tony Romo. And obviously, Romo and Jessica got blamed to some extent for their distracted downfall. So what did I see this year right away from Taylor and Travis? I saw that he was inspired by her presence at his games. He, he lit up for her when she was watching from above in a box. He loves showing off for her in a very good way. And if you look at the season as a whole, Chiefs went nine and three with her in attendance, four and two without her at the games. But look at Travis's numbers. With her at games, he averaged catching seven balls for 79 yards, and he did have five touchdowns. Without her at games, he caught six balls for only 50 yards and had three touchdown catches. So he averaged 29 more yards per game 
when she was in attendance. But starting in late November, Travis Kelsey began to struggle. Chiefs lost two of three in one stretch. His numbers began to fall against Miami. Caught only three balls for 14 yards. Another rough patch hit later in December. Game against Cincinnati on December 31st. He caught only three balls for 16 yards. And to me, Travis Kelsey began to look like he was running on empty. Looked like maybe he had lost a step at age 34 in his 11th season. Maybe he'd taken one too many hits, run after catch hits. He always doubles down on the football, covers it up with both hands, tries to run through the brick walls that try to tackle him. He's a tough run after catch runner. Takes a lot of hits, does Travis Kelsey. So, yep, I thought maybe her schedule had just run him ragged. And there was a moment late in the season when he even reflected upon, mentioned that he had at least considered retirement. Hmm. And I thought, well, I don't know, maybe, maybe after this year he will retire so he can spend more time with her. Maybe he'll just happily become Mr. Swift. It sure looked like the Chiefs were going nowhere swiftly. Finished 11-6 and six in the regular season. And all of a sudden, it hit home that to advance in the playoffs, Patrick Mahomes was going to have to play his first ever road playoff games after the first one at home, if they could win that one. That was against Miami. So Travis Kelsey closed the season with six straight games and eight of the last nine without catching a touchdown pass. Very unlike Travis Kelsey, perennial pro bowler as he is, widely regarded as the best pass-catching tight end in NFL history. But then came those playoffs. And Travis Kelsey took off like, well, Taylor Swift has taken off. Suddenly, Travis Kelsey's star shot back across the NFL universe like nothing we'd ever seen before from him. Maybe because he thought to himself, no way was he going to fail in playoff games with her on hand, looking down from above. Against Miami, Travis Kelsey caught seven balls for 71 yards. Then he upped the ante at Buffalo in Mahomes' first ever road playoff game with five catches for 75 yards. And then at Baltimore, Lord have mercy. I thought the Ravens would win this game. Nope. First half alone, Travis Kelsey was thrown nine passes. He caught all nine for almost 100 yards as the Chiefs shot to a 17-7 halftime lead that their defense made stand up for a 17-10 win. For the game, Travis Kelsey was throwing 11 footballs. He caught all 11 for 116 yards in a touchdown. So let's look back. Against Miami, 71 yards. Against Buffalo, 75. Against Baltimore, 116. Two touchdown catches against Buffalo, one against Baltimore, he was back to being every bit of the superstar tight end we'd come to know and love. Whoa. Wow. So after Taylor won two Grammys on Sunday night, Travis Kelsey on Monday night responded to a question at media night by saying, 
I got to hold up my end of the bargain and bring home some hardware. I mean, how can Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid or any of the Chiefs not love that? <sighs> Travis Kelsey, right on schedule, has turned back into a star whose power rivals Patrick Mahomes. So, stepping back, has his relationship with her helped the New Heights podcast that he does with his brother Jason, taking it to New Heights? Well, sure it has. Has her presence on the NFL stage helped promote her to a, a new audience, a little different audience? Well, I guess so. But I'm not sure she needed much promotional help to begin with. I will say, early on, I thought she laid it on a little thick when Travis made a big catch down on the field and she obviously knew the camera was on her for a react shot and it just seemed like her reacts were a little over the top. But as the season wore on and I saw them over and over and over again, I started to think, well, maybe that's just the way she is. You know, it's funny, a college friend of mine from Vanderbilt who lives in Nashville, he writes for various publications about all kinds of music. He goes in depth about alt rock. And after early on this season, I expressed some skepticism about Taylor Swift on Undisputed, a show he watches, I guess, most every morning. He texted me a, a defense of her that was surprisingly critical of me. It was not like him. I do respect his knowledge of anything music, but what struck me was how much he believes in her on and off stage, on and off camera. Wow, eyes opened. My wife Ernestine is friends with a high profile movie and music critic in New York. She made the mistake the other day of texting him a somewhat flippant comment about Taylor Swift at the Super Bowl. And he fired back a scathing rebuke in defense of all things Taylor Swift. She was dumbfounded. She brought it to me and said, can you believe this? I said, yes, I can. I know the feeling. Ernestine and I stand corrected Travis Kelsey plus Taylor Swift just works. It will take over the Super Bowl because I believe Travis Kelsey will take over the Super Bowl. Inspired by his girlfriend. A question from you, from Matt from Arizona. What Super Bowl prop bets are you a fan of or might you look to bet on for the game? So Matt, allow me to use your question to make my Super Bowl prediction. And allow me first to tell you about whatever connections I've had to either of these, both of these franchises low over these many years. Start with Kansas City. If you know the story of Lamar Hunt, who did name the Super Bowl the Super Bowl, it's from Dallas, Texas. I got to know him very well. Got to know 
his now late great wife Norma very well. After the radio show I used to do in Dallas, I went straight to Larry North Total Fitness in Highland Park Village to lift weights. And Norma was always there every morning doing her workout. And we would chit chat about the Chiefs and about this and about that. And she was a gem, as was her husband, Lamar. My favorite Lamar story is a very young man in his 20s. He was able to purchase the Dallas Texans that played in the AFL, tried to compete with the Dallas Cowboys for Dallas's heart. One day after a practice in Dallas, a Texans practice, Lamar was standing with a group of reporters. One of his stars trotted out of the locker room and hopped into a waiting convertible featuring a hot blonde. And Lamar said, you know, some guys have all the luck. This coming from the mouth of the son of a Texas oil baron billionaire. Yeah, some guys do. Lamar wanted to be that guy. A lot of us would like to be Lamar, who was as humble a rich guy as I have ever known. And I've known a whole bunch of rich guys. Always flew coach till death did him part. Just filthy rich and flew coach never came across as holier than thou or bigger than anybody around, did not light up a room. He shrank in rooms. Good man, Lamar. I miss him. His Texans just couldn't compete with the Cowboys, so he moved them to Kansas City where they became the Chiefs. And his son, Clark, obviously, now owns and operates said Chiefs. What are my 49er connections? I've mentioned before, I had the honor and privilege of getting close with the man I believe is the greatest coach, was the greatest coach ever, Bill Walsh. Spoke twice to his class that he taught at Stanford Business School after he had retired from coaching. I love you, Bill, I miss you. He was something. You talk about a mastermind. He invented an offense and he picked every player to run set offense and to play on his defense. Picked them all, unlike another coach that I'm going to talk about here in a few minutes who has been exposed and was always overrated. But also in the 49er history, I got close with Another GM of theirs, Terry Donahue, the former UCLA coach. Got to know him well, loved him, good man. 49ers have had a lot of good people involved. Also in that era, back in the early 2000s, got to know John York, then the owner and operator of the 49ers, and liked him a lot. His son Jed now owns and operates. But the point is, when I'm talking Chiefs, and 49ers, I really don't have a passion for either team. I don't have a conviction about either. I don't have a real rooting interest except those blasts from the past. And as you know, I'm not a big Patrick Mahomes fan only because I am the biggest Tom Brady fan. And my blood boils when I continue to hear Patrick Mahomes has already surpassed Brady to become the guy. Are you kidding? Are you serious? Talked about it last week. Don't get me started again this week. I mean, come on. Tom Brady played better in all 10 of his Super Bowls than Patrick played in the one that he lost to Tom Brady. Seriously? I mean, Brady threw for 304 yards on average per 10 Super Bowl games. 10, 304 a game. Patrick's average 246 a game in three. 
I don't think he's had a signature spectacular game yet. And as I did last week, I backed it up by spitting facts. But I must admit, Patrick Mahomes has impressed me through this playoff run. During the regular season, he had a career-high 14 interceptions. Maybe it's because Travis Kelsey struggled for a while. Maybe it's because too many of his receivers dropped too many passes. And he wasn't sure. And he was a little off target and a little out of whack for much of the season. I mean, 14 interceptions. Dak had 15 a year ago and tied for the lead. Lead. But guess what, ladies and gentlemen, in three playoff games, Patrick Mahomes has had zero turnovers, zero interceptions, zero lost fumbles, and zero turnover-worthy throws, those kind that maybe could have or should have been intercepted, not one in three playoff games. That is impressive. As he said on the field right after the Baltimore win, that I didn't see coming. Patrick said, I'm different. I play different now. And he described to me a game manager. So wait, everybody says Brock Purdy's a game manager when he's the flip side of that. He's the polar opposite of game manager. Brock Purdy is high risk, high reward, gunslinging. And by the way, my favorite Super Bowl stat is that no quarterback in the league had a higher success rate on passes that traveled 20 or more yards downfield than Brock Purdy had. Bombs away. Game manager? You are mismanaging that perception. Yet, Patrick Mahomes has been game managing. He has been dinking and dunking, often in the playoffs, to number 87, to Travis Kelsey. But remember, last year's Super Bowl, he was the MVP again, second time. But he threw for a grand total of 182 yards against what I kept saying, that's a bad Eagles defense. Dak had torched it. It obviously got completely annihilated this year wound up 30th in the league in points allowed. Pretty much the same defense as it was last year, minus the coordinator, give you that. So back to Matt's question about prop bets. Patrick Mahomes over under for passing yards is 260.5. 260.5 over under passing yards for Patrick Mahomes. I'm going under. I'll give him 220-ish in this game, but but no 260, no 270, no 280. I'm sorry, no 300. Still hasn't had a 300-yard game in a Super Bowl in three tries. Brady had two 300-yard pluses, one 400-yard plus, one 500-yard plus, but who's counting? Patrick Mahomes will go under 260 passing yards, 220-ish, but I believe he will win the Super Bowl because he will not make a single mistake. No interceptions, no sack fumbles, no lost fumbles on scrambles. And I believe that Brock Purdy will throw two interceptions. And they will cost San Francisco a close game. I'll call it 24-22 Chiefs. For me, a very evenly matched football game just boils down to Patrick Mahomes or Brock Purdy. Patrick Mahomes or Brock Purdy. Simple as that to me. Do you want the quote-unquote greatest quarterback ever already? Or do you want Mr. Irrelevant? Uh, I think I want number 15 for the Chiefs. Now, wait wait a second. That guy, that guy Patrick Mahomes, is a two-and-a-half-point underdog in this game? So he'll be able to play 
the no respect card going into this game, trust me, he will, quietly, privately, internally. You're telling me that Patrick Mahomes will have the biggest chip on his shoulder pads? He's the one with something to, are you kidding me? Give me the underdog Chiefs. Give me Patrick Mahomes under 260.5. And give me a break, Richard Sherman, with all this believe in Brock Purdy nonsense because I'm sorry, I don't. This is Daniel from Toronto. What do you want the Cowboys to trade for or or draft this year? Daniel. I'm going to apologize up front for this one. This question, from my heart, it's too painful to answer. I'm not exaggerating. I'm not fabricating. I'm just telling you straight from the bottom of my heart, it's just too painful. It's just too soon. I just don't have enough hope left. My wound is, is still just too deep and it is still festering. Do I have to relive it? We, we had the two seed. We had two home games against Green Bay and Detroit to get to our first NFC Championship game in 28 years, albeit if it had to be at San Francisco, so be it. The third playoff time would be the charm, I thought, against San Francisco, where at least last year we'd gone out there and played defense. At least we'd lost only 19 to 12, even though our quarterback stunk. At least it was respectable. At least it gave me hope. So this time against Green Bay, we didn't lose 34 to 31 the way we did at the end of Dak's rookie year, Zeke's rookie year to Aaron Rodgers. We didn't lose on two intergalactic field goals by Mason Crossbar, hand of God field goals, damnedest things I've ever seen. One a dying quail that somehow skittered over the crossbar as it faded to the right. And the other one, the game winner, duck hooked left and then hand of God moves it back to the right indoors with no wind. I, I've never seen anything like that before, but it happened. But we competed. Yeah, we got down, what was it, 21 to three. We fought back. We competed. We had a shot. This was 27 to nothing before halftime. Think about that. This was 48 to 16 in the fourth quarter. 48 to 16? What? In my life, in my sports watching life, since I was three years old, I have never ever been more blindsided, more dumbfounded, more thunderstruck, more gobsmacked by any game I have ever, ever, ever watched. I'm sorry, Daniel. I just haven't gotten over it. I don't think I'll ever get over it. That game was so hopeless that it, it honestly made me question my fandom been a Cowboy fan since I was 10 years old in their second year of existence, 1961. It's a long time. I seriously have been thinking about, should I order a Jordan Love jersey just for fun, just to have it to wear around? I don't know. Just for grins? Just because I like Jordan Love as much as I hated what he did to us? A number 10? I, I don't know. I like that Green Bay team. I like it a lot. My brother Lil Wayne and I talk about it all the time. 
It's going to go places. I wouldn't be shocked if Green Bay's in the Super Bowl next year. Loaded with young, rising star talent everywhere. A real live quarterback you can trust in big games and in fourth quarters. So, Daniel, how can I talk about, well, if, if we just add a running back, or maybe a defensive tackle, it was 27 to nothing before halftime. We were non competitive. We were lifeless and hapless and hopeless. I, I saw a stat the other day. I don't even know how to decipher it. It's called DVOA. I'm sure you've seen it. I, I won't try to explain it. All I can tell you is that only four teams this year in the National Football League were top 10 on offense and defense in the all-important DVOA. The two Super Bowl teams, Kansas City, San Francisco, the Baltimore Ravens, who I thought were the best team all year long, didn't prove it in the championship game, but I thought all year long, so I get that and I give you that. And the fourth team was... My team, or maybe it's my ex-team, I don't know. The fourth team was the Dallas Cowboys. That's how good statistically they were going into that playoff game. And I remind you, the players, National Football League players, voted the Cowboys the most Pro Bowl players. The most belonged to the Dallas Cowboys and then that happened? So, so we need what, Daniel? We need a this or a that or, you know what? Here's the painful truth. We need, number one, a new coach, and we're not going to get one. And we need, number two, a new quarterback, and we're not going to get one. We are stuck with both. I, I got to tell you, seriously, from the bottom of my soul, all of my hope got destroyed by the time it was 27 to nothing. I mean, that's just unacceptable, right? It's inconceivable. It's unconscionable. I, I'm still not sure it happened. I, I've heard this same sentiment from so many Cowboy fans I know. My great friend, my financial advisor in Dallas, Texas, my financial guru, Pat Beard. I'll read you a text he sent me just yesterday. We were going back and forth about business issue. He and I hadn't talked about what happened on that fateful day against Green Bay. And he texted, I know you've heard this from just about everyone you know, but I'll just chime in and say that the Packers' loss was the most embarrassing of my 55-year career as an avid Cowboys fan. I still can't believe it happened. The lack of changes don't leave me very optimistic for next year. I get it right in the heart. So we need a what? The truth is, the God's truth is, We need a new owner slash general manager. Okay, quick aside, speaking of the NFC East, about the Philadelphia Eagles. I heard this from a very trusted source who has never steered me wrong. This source told me that a reason for the Eagles' collapse is they lost six of their last seven games, including getting blown out at Tampa in the playoff game by Baker Mayfield. A reason for that collapse 
was a personal issue between Jalen Hurts and A.J. Brown, an off-field issue that created some on-field friction. And that the issue was caused by Jalen. And here I'd always lauded and applauded his leadership intangibles. Hmm. I just toss it out because it's something to keep your eye on and your ears open about. This is Denny from Rome, New York. Do you believe Bill Belichick coaches again in the NFL? Denny, I sure hope he does. Because if he does, he will get further exposed. I've been saying this for, what, 10 years? On live TV, both at ESPN and FS1. Tom Brady was 75% of the reason for the Patriots dynasty. And yet I fight day after day on Undisputed with Keyshawn Johnson, who knows Bill Belichick very well, Michael Irvin, who lives in awe of Bill Belichick. And I kid both of them that they must have majored in mythology in college. because Bill Belichick is mostly myth to me. Now understand, I don't know Tom Brady personally. I've never talked to Tom Brady. He's, I think, going to be our teammate here next fall at Fox. I don't know if I'll cross his path or not. I just know I've always believed in him because it was obvious that he was the reason, he was the key he was at least 75% of the credit for that dynasty. Man, I won a whole lot of live TV bets thanks to Thomas Edward Patrick Brady Jr. Again, he won his first six Super Bowls with game-winning drives in the fourth quarter or overtime. And Bill Belichick convinced Robert Kraft that he was washed as in up as in done, as in get him out of my sight, as in Tom Brady got dumped by the Patriots. Biggest mistake Bill Belichick ever made, but he made a bunch of them. All of them canceled, most of them canceled by number 12, who then of course goes to Tampa in a pandemic and takes a seven and nine team to a Super Bowl championship. Meanwhile, Bill Belichick, over the last four years without Brady, has gone in New England 29 and 38. Nine games under 500. Overall in his head coaching career, including the five years in Cleveland and the first year in New England without Brady, the two games to start that Brady year without Brady, Bill Belichick's record was 35 and 45. No, Tom, 35 and 45. That's 10 games under 500 without Thomas Edward Patrick Brady Jr. Belichick's mentor, Bill Parcells, would call that kind of record the kind that a Jag would have, a J-A-G, just another guy. Bill Belichick proved to be the Michael Jordan of NFL team builders. I'm the biggest Michael Jordan fan as a player, but when it came to team building in Charlotte, he was a disaster. He was the all-time worst. But he didn't have a Brady to cancel out, to camouflage the bad choices, the bad picks, the bad signings. Belichick had Brady. Belichick had Brady in the locker room, one of the greatest leaders, if not the greatest ever, to continue to tell new players, young players, upset players, 
oh, that's just the way Bill is. Just it's, it's okay. We'll, we'll we'll figure it out. Don't don't worry. The message was always, we'll win in spite of Bill. And his barbed tongue, and his old school coaching, and his my way or the highway. Brady canceled out so much bad Bill that it got to the point that. I just said, who's going to hire him? There were seven openings other than New England's, obviously. Gerard Mayo elevated. Love that. Hope it works. But seven other openings, you, you'd think Bill Belichick, I'm told on Undisputed on a daily basis, he's by far the greatest coach ever. Well, then why didn't the seven teams with openings line up and tr- try to outbid each other for Bill Belichick's services? Didn't happen. They're seeing what I saw over the last four years. He got to one playoff game and defensive mastermind that he is. And I do give him that. I think he's one of the greatest. I, I've given Keyshawn and Michael, okay, let's call him the greatest defensive coordinator ever. He, in New England, he was just a glorified defensive coordinator. But without Brady, he goes to Buffalo in a playoff game and, and gets blitzed. 47 to 17, never making Josh Allen's offense punt, never stopping them from scoring on every possession. They scored a touchdown or a field goal, 47 to 17. I don't blame these owners and GMs for sitting back and saying, wait a second, are you sure? No, you're not sure. And obviously there's the control issue. Bill wants more control. He wants this, he wants that. Once upon a time, he deserved it, but not without Tom. So if I were an owner with an opening, I would have said, well, you you bringing Brady with you? No, no, he's going to stay retired. Just can't relate to, can't coach, can't overcoach today's players that way. And so seven teams said no. And if... Next hiring cycle, some team does buy into the myth, hires Bill Belichick to be their head coach. I'll just sit back and watch and wait because he'll get further exposed, which will make it even more advantage Tom Brady. This is Blaine from Houston. Where are you watching the Super Bowl this year? Blaine, I'm not a Super Bowl party guy. I am going to Las Vegas to do an appearance for a couple of days, but I'm not going to stay because there's only one way to watch a Super Bowl. For me, that's where I always watch it. In my man cave, my TV room, my office slash weeknight bedroom, just me and my quote-unquote daughter Hazel, our Maltese, sleeps in her bed at my feet through just about every game I watch. She'll be there, I hope. Sometimes she gets miffed at me, but... I think she'll be there with me this Sunday. So understand, I, I went to, I covered so many Super Bowls. I started all the way back, Super Bowl 10, got all the way through the, the Brady Super Bowl against that first one against the Eagles in Jacksonville. So that's a, I lost track, I lost count. However many that is in a row is how many I actually attended and covered and watched on site. And what I learned from all those years, low those many Super Bowls is, there's only one way to watch the game, and it's on television. You can see so much more on television. More important, I can see what you're seeing at home, which is what we want to react to on Monday on Undisputed. What did you see as opposed to what I'm seeing just with my eyes from far above 
in a sky box of a press box that requires binoculars to actually see what's happening on the field. Only one way to watch, and that's on television. And by the way, I do want to see the commercials just because you're seeing the commercials. Maybe two or three will catch my eye, and maybe we'll talk about two or three on Monday on Undisputed. The most clever, the most inventive, the most creative, the ones we'll remember. Usually, the better they are, the less I can even remember what they were for, what they were actually trying to sell me. But I have never, ever been to a Super Bowl party in my life. And it's just because I can't concentrate in those situations. I know what would happen. I know what's happened when I occasionally have tried to sit in the stands, people around me, the moment a play happens, what would you think of that? So I'm at a Super Bowl party and people, what would you think of that? And as you probably know, if you follow me on Twitter, I love to live tweet. I, I, it is a rush for me to live tweet because for so many years in press boxes all over the world, I wrote columns against deadline, on deadline. I had 30 minutes to write an entire column after a Cowboy game, sometimes 20 minutes. My days in Dallas to make those deadlines so we could get the newspaper back in the days of real live printed newspapers to your doorstep by 6 a.m. You had 20 minutes. You had to scramble. You had to type. I, I can't even type that fast. And I type, I don't know, 60, 70 words a minute. I'm, I'm pretty fast. But there are nights I couldn't even type that fast. The first thought that comes to your brain, you, you just have to spew and spew and spill and spew all over the page. And then I used to get up on a Monday morning, let's say, after a Sunday night Cowboy game, go get the paper on the doorstep and look at what I had wrought or written. And I'd read the first three paragraphs and say, I, I can't believe that went in the newspaper. It's so bad. But I, I couldn't be too self-critical because I was typing as fast as I can and dancing as fast as I could. So I, I still get a rush from t live tweeting on deadline after pl immediately after plays. Well, you can't really do that when everybody around you is saying, what did you think? Well, I, I thought, no, that's when I would be tweeting. Live tweeting takes supreme concentration. Obviously, you can screw up. You can be inaccurate. You can be too outrageous. You can step over the line. A lot can go on live tweeting, but I love it, and I'll be doing it this Sunday during the Super Bowl. You can book it. But I couldn't do it at a Super Bowl party. Couldn't keep my head in the game at a Super Bowl party. So... I will be, as always, flying solo with Hazel. Last question comes from Abby from Boston. What's your Super Bowl food of choice? Okay, Abby, I appreciate the question, but once again, I'm the wrong guy to ask. No Super Bowl parties for me. And the truth is, the God's truth is, my Super Bowl food of choice is, is, <laughs> is my food of choice for every game I ever watch in any sport. I just eat the same things every day of my life. Over and over and over again, I groundhog day it. Because I like it this way. I'll be the first to admit I'm vain. I like the way I look. I work too hard. I work out too hard to say, oh, it's Thanksgiving. I think I'll eat whatever I want to eat. Or, oh, it's Christmas. I'll just splurge. Or, oh, it's New Year's. I'll pig out. Or, oh, it's Super Bowl Sunday. Whatever, whenever, I'll eat it all. Seafood, eat food. I just don't do it. 
I learned a long time ago, just not worth it because you eat it, you wear it, you just will. Trust me on that. And that's fine if that's what you want to do. I love food, but I love the food that I eat. I'll have my chicken or my turkey or my fish, my broccoli, my rice, my protein bars. But I'm not going to splurge. I'm not going to cheat. I do cheat. I, I tell you, we have one cheat, quote unquote, meal, Ernestine and I, my wife and I, on Friday nights, we have a slice of pizza. I'm, I'm getting to where I don't even like cheese on it. I, I just like the taste of tomato sauce and vegetables on the crust, the bread, whatever you call it, the dough. But this Sunday, I'll just eat the same things I always eat. I, I don't know. Maybe I'll have every once in a while on Sundays during NFL games, I'll have a little um, air pop popcorn. So there, that'll be my splurge for this Super Bowl. That'll be my food of choice for this Super Bowl. Air-popped popcorn. That's it for episode 100. Thanks to you for listening and or watching. Thanks to Jonathan Berger and his all-pro team for making this show go. Thanks to Tyler Korn for producing. Please remember, Undisputed, every weekday, 9.30 to noon Eastern, The Skip Bayless Show every week.